Welcome to question 8 of the 2017 Mathematical Methods Exam 1 for the Northern Hemisphere. In this video we will be looking at the solution and examination advice for this question. A reminder that this video is in no way endorsed by VCAR. For question 8 we have the rule for the function f is given by f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 3 subtract 1, where f is defined on its maximal domain. For part a we're asked to find the domain and the rule for the inverse function of f. So just at the bottom of our work I'm going to put a little prompt down for myself to say that we need to give a rule for the inverse function f negative 1 of x and it will have a rule that we're going to find and also we're going to state its domain for x is an element of some domain. And now before we find the rule and the domain of the inverse I'm just going to start by sketching a graph of the original function f of x. So f of x is a square root graph and it's going to have an endpoint at negative 3 on 2 comma negative 1. So negative 3 on 2 comma negative 1 down here is going to be its endpoint. And then it's going to look something like this as a graph. So that was negative 3 on 2 and that point there was negative 1. So now we can talk about the domain and the range of both the function f and its inverse function. So from the graph we can see the domain of f would be from x is negative 3 on 2 to infinity and that the range would be from negative 1 to infinity. Now for a function and its inverse we simply swap the domain and range. So we know that the domain of the inverse is now going to be negative 1 to infinity and the range is going to be from negative 3 on 2 to infinity. So now we can answer part of our question and that is the domain of f inverse, which we just found to be negative one to infinity. Next up, we need to find the rule. So our starting point here is going to be let y equal the function f of x. So therefore we can write this as y is equal to the square root of two x plus three minus one. And next we're going to swap x and y to find the inverse. So therefore we have x is equal to the square root of 2y plus 3 subtract 1. And now we need to solve this equation for y. So if we start by adding 1 to both sides we end up with x plus 1 equals the square root of 2y plus 3. And then squaring both sides we get x plus 1 all squared is equal to 2y plus 3. And now to get y by itself, we're going to start by subtracting 3. So we'll have x plus 1 squared minus 3. And then we need to divide all of that by 2. So that is the rule and the domain of the inverse function of f. For part b, we want to solve f of x is equal to its inverse function. So when we're solving f of x is equal to its inverse function, that's the first equation you could solve that would give the solutions. A second equation you could solve would be f of x is equal to just x. And that's because f and its inverse are a reflection over the line y equals x. So their points of intersection usually lie on the line y equals x. And the third equation you could solve would be f inverse of x is equal to x. For the same logic as we discussed in the second option. So for this question we're going to solve f of x is equal to x, so we'll have 2x plus 3 subtract 1 is equal to x. And now adding 1 to both sides we get the square root of 2x plus 3 is equal to x plus 1. And then if we square both sides we'll get 2x plus 3 is equal to x plus 1 all squared. And now if we expanded those brackets on the right hand side we'd have 2x plus 3 is equal to x squared. And just be careful here, this is a binomial expansion, so we get x squared plus 2x plus 1. And now that's a quadratic equation that we want to solve, so we want to get it equal to 0. So we're going to have x squared, and then if we subtract 2x from both sides, it will cancel. And then if we subtract 3, we're going to get x squared, subtract 2 is equal to 0. So therefore, we know that x must equal plus or minus the square root of 2. However, and this is very important, we just found that the domain of the inverse function of f of x is equal to negative 1 to infinity. And negative square root 2 is smaller than negative 1, 
So therefore, the only solution for x is x is the square root of 2. And that is the answer to part b of this question. For part c of this question, we let g be the function with the rule g of x equals the square root of 2x plus c subtract 1, where d is the maximal domain of g and c is a real number. For part one of this question, we're asked for what values of c does g of x equal g inverse of x have no solutions? So as with our previous question, we're going to solve g of x, which is 2x plus c minus 1, is just equal to x, as that's a valid way of finding the points of intersection. So therefore, the square root of 2x plus c must equal x plus 1, when we add 1 to both sides of the equation. And then squaring both sides, we get 2x plus c is equal to, and we have x plus 1 squared here, which we're going to expand on our next line. So we'd have 2x plus c is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. And getting that as a quadratic equation equal to zero, we'd get x squared, and then we'd have plus one minus c equals zero when it's been rearranged. And we know that there's no solutions to a quadratic equation if the discriminant is less than zero. So that means that we want b squared minus four ac to be less than zero. So for this quadratic, our value of a is one, we actually have b equals zero because there's no coefficient of x and all of this gives that c is actually equal to one minus c. And that's a little bit confusing. These are just positions a, b and c in a general quadratic form. So therefore we have b squared is zero squared minus four times a is one times c is one subtract c. We want that to be less than zero and simplifying the left hand side will actually give minus 4 plus 4c is less than 0. So therefore 4c is less than 4 when we add 4 to both sides. So we know that c must be less than 1. So that is the answer to part 1 of part c of this question. So from the examiner's report, they took a slightly different way of solving this question, which I'm just going to talk through a little bit now. So they got to the equation that was x squared equals c subtract 1. I'm just going to do a little bit more work on that now. And I'm actually going to turn this into x squared plus 1 is equal to c. So that's the same equation, just slightly rearranged. And in the examiner's report, they conclude that c is less than 1 gives no solutions. And we're just going to look at this from a graphical perspective right now. So if in blue I graph x squared plus 1, that will be this graph with a turning point here at 0, 0,1. So that is y equals x squared plus 1. And then y equals c is a horizontal line. So provided that horizontal line here at y equals c is somewhere less than 1, so any of these lines here, provided that c is less than 1, there's no points of intersection between x squared plus 1 and c which will give no solutions to the equation. So that's what they've really summarized in their algebraic working in the solutions. For part two of part C, it asks for what values of C does the function G and G inverse have exactly one real solution? So using the discriminant, we know that there is one solution if the discriminant's value is equal to zero. And we had an expression for the discriminant on the previous slide, which I'll borrow. So it was minus four C plus four. And this time, instead of being less than zero, we'll let it equal zero. And that will give C equals one. And now it would be very tempting to say that that's the answer to this problem and that it's all done. However, there's a little bit more to this than just that answer. So to help illustrate this to you, I'm going to sketch three graphs. And in each graph, we're going to have g of x, which is going to be represented by blue, and g inverse of x, which is going to be represented by green. So for the graph of g, if we inspect its rule, it is always going to have an endpoint that is at y equals negative one. So these points here, it's not an asymptote that I'm drawing on, it's just a representation that it has endpoints that could be at any value along y equals negative one. 
Similarly, the inverse function is always going to have an end point or a starting point along the line x equals negative 1. So when c equals 1, which we found before to give one solution, a graph actually looks a little bit like this. So that's the graph of g, and the inverse function will look something like this. And it has just one point of intersection, which actually turns out to be 0, 0. And now on our second graph, we need to consider what happens when our value of c changes. So if we pick values of c that are less than 1, we already found in the first part of this question that we get no solutions. So let's pick some values that are bigger than 1. So the next value that I want to consider is actually c equals 2, because inspecting the rule that will force the point of intersection for both of the graphs to be at negative 1, negative 1. So if c equals 2, we get this graph here, so that is going to be the graph of g, and this graph here, and that's going to be the graph of its inverse. And you can see that there's some point of intersection up here that would have some coordinates x and y. We're not really interested in what the particular values are, just that there is a point of intersection. And there's also a point of intersection here, which is at negative 1, comma, negative 1. And this is the graph of if c is equal to 2. So anywhere in between c is equal to 1 and c is equal to 2, we actually get two points of intersection for those graphs. And once we get to a number that's greater than 2, our graph of g will start to look like this, and our graph of the inverse will look something like this. And we can see that there's only one point of intersection up here on the graph. And this graph represents cases where c is going to be greater than 2. And all the way back in part A and B of this question, it was actually leading us towards this conclusion, because they gave us the case where c equals 3, and we found that the point of intersection of that graph was actually at root 2, comma, root 2. So that's what we found in an earlier part of this question, which should lead you to think that there was more than just c equals 1 that gives one point of intersection between their two graphs. So just to summarise what we've just found, we know that c equals 1 will give one solution and the case where c is greater than 2 will also give only one point of intersection between the graphs of g and g inverse. So that is the full answer to this question. Now the examiner's report is quite brief on this question, however if I was to hazard a guess, part cii would have been done exceptionally poorly with what I imagine being most students that got part of this question correct, only finding c equals 1 using the discriminant and not considering the c greater than 2 case. Now the examiner's report approached this question in a more algebraic fashion. So what they discussed is that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of c take 1 is the solutions between the function g and g inverse, and I'll show where that came from in a moment. And they said that it must be in the domain of both g and g inverse, but only once in each. So to go through this problem in a bit more detail using the examiner's method, we would have had the square root of 2x plus c minus 1 is equal to x, and that gives us 2x plus c is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1, like we've found a number of times so far. So that would give x squared is equal to c subtract 1 when we rearrange it, and that gives x is equal to plus or minus the square root of c subtract 1, which is what the examiners introduced in their report. So next we need to think back to the domain of g, which was a maximal domain, so its domain would be negative c on 2 to infinity, and that the domain of its inverse, g negative 1, is actually the easier one to deal with because it's just negative 1 to infinity still. And this is the domain where we really need to put our attention right now. So if we need x is equal to plus or minus c subtract 1 to fit inside that domain just once, because it's plus or minus, if we had the value 1, we'd get positive 1 and negative 1 that would both fit in there. So we need the value of the square root of c minus 1 to actually be a number bigger than 1. So when we have the negative case of it, it will fall outside the domain. So that logic will actually lead us to say that c take 1 must be greater than 1, 
and that finally C must be greater than 2 when you add 1 to both sides. So that is how they reach the conclusion in this examiner's report. So not that we get this sort of luxury in a technology free examination, but what we're going to do now is look at an animation which represents the question we've just been working on. So as you can see, when C is equal to 1, we get one point of intersection just here at the origin between the function G in blue and the inverse of G in green. And now if we animate that value of C so it changes, we can see for a few values here of C we actually get two points of intersection. Starting that again we can see we get to a point here where we have just one point of intersection which is occurring up here. And then as the values change back we go from one briefly to two and then we have one again and none. So there's a set of values of C that also give no points of intersection between the graph of G and its inverse.